بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله hope everybody is doing well uh, so tonight is a is a special night it is the 27th of Rajab the latest al Isra wal Mi'raj Alhamdulillah, one of the best things that we can be doing on this night is gathering together as believers, learning the deen of our Messenger وسلم, and this was a night in which strong parts of the deen were given to him uh, and then they were passed down. And so we'll discuss that inshallah, but we'll continue on in our discussion of the soul's eternal journey. Um, and we have reached the third section. So this is the section once somebody finishes out and culminates their life in this dunya, in this world, which is the purpose for the human creation, they will then transition into another realm, into another world. And this transition is literally the main thing that the human being has hopefully been working for and preparing for their entire life. And if not, then uh, it, it should become the main thing that we are working for and that we are preparing for. And this is the moment at which we die, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his Quran that Kullu nafsin maut, every soul shall taste death and will taste death and is tasting death because every day that goes by is a day that we actually don't get back in our life. It is that day, that part of our life we have already died essentially and we are moving closer and closer to a death that we don't know when it exists. Dhikr al maut remembering death is one of the most virtuous ways to clean the heart, to clean the qalb. And it is one of the most virtuous ways to get close to Allah. Allah mentions death often in the Quran. It's very, very frequent, the mentioning of death. And the Prophet وسلم, told us to frequently mention death in our gatherings and to frequently mention death in our life. Why? Because it helps the believer anchor themselves and realize that yes, I'm here in this world, but I'm here for a purpose. It is one of the many lives that I'm going to live. And the purpose of this life is to prepare for that moment in which I will leave this world and which I will, inshallah, meet Allah. I will leave this world in which I will meet our Lord. Uh, our, our Lord. And so we'll he's going to talk in this section about the different things that happen when somebody actually passes away and the questions that we are asked in the grave now and while most of these things are fairly um straightforward we've probably learned about them before maybe we might know some of the basics these are supposed to not be concepts that just sit in the brain they're supposed to be deep spiritual realities that penetrate the hearts and when the reality penetrates the heart it should change the way in which we live our life it should change the way in which we live our uh, our life we don't want this these concepts to simply be um no, 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 that's not hot heater. No, no, no. Uh, that these are concepts that should actively result in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in it with an impact on our life. So he says that at some point, every believer is going to die and there is the moment of death. And he actually doesn't expand upon the moment of death in too much detail um, in this specific uh, uh, text but he gets into what happens right after the believer passes away. Other scholars, um, Imam Ghazali has a whole book that's written entirely on every single thing that's going to happen when you die. And just so you can prepare yourself for it. And what is going to happen, the things that the believer will see or will not see, the way in which they will experience things, the, the feeling that happens when the soul is leaving the body, all these different feelings that happen. Because when one dies, they enter into an entirely different realm where they are very much present and awake. Everybody around us at this moment starts to think that we're gone, but we actually have just woken up at this point. So as Sayyidina Ali, uh, he says that people are asleep and when they die, they wake up, the vast majority of people. So he says, wake up before those moments. Let your nafs start to die before the day in which everything, the sensory realm will start to disappear. This is something now we can actually practice and implement. And we should practice and implement because these concepts, they're not meant to be things we just learn in like a, in a Sunday school fashion, just memorize them and they don't make any impact. We should start to reflect on these moments. How will I be when I die? 
So we live our life through this dunya. For some, it will be 30 years, 40 years. Some, it will be 70 years, 80 years. For others, it might be much, 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 uh, uh, a few, many fewer years than that, maybe 10 years, 12 years. But everybody has a lifespan that's been written for them on the day that they were, that, they, that, that Allah created them and on the day that they are born. Then they now start to go through life and they live that lifespan. So we don't know when that day is going to come. We don't know when that, but when that day does come, the preparation is going to be very, very important. And so the first thing that one can do is actually start to meditate and reflect on what will I be? What state will I be in when I die? What state will I be in when I die? What, what hal will I have when I pass away? And what will be the experience that I will be experiencing? You kind of try to imagine this experience, right? So, so one can actually do a form of, of tafakkur, reflection, meditation, where they start to think, okay, I'm going to be in some place, whether it will be with people, whether it will be sudden, whether it will be in a hospital, whether it will be while I was sick, and then I will start to experience the different feelings that come with death. Every believer will see the angel of death. We'll see, everybody will see the angel of death. The believers will see the angel of death, ideally, inshallah, if their life was righteous in a pure form and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more beautiful form. The people of either disbelief, kufr, or sinfulness will see a very scary situation start at the moment in which death begins. A very, and that is the first bad sign for them of a ruined life in the hereafter. That what they see when they are, and they start to get into a state of trepidation and worry and anxiety. And at this point, no, nobody can help them. Because this is at the point where only Allah knows what's happening and when he's going to take the soul. He mentions this in Surah Al-Waqiyah. That as the soul gets closer and closer, who will actually be there? Only God will be there. And so your relationship with God now becomes of utmost importance. If somebody had a pure relationship with God, Allah will inshallah choose to bless them with a husn al khatima, a good ending, a good seal. And then Allah will hopefully be with them when they pass away. And hopefully their loved ones that are with them will be reminding them of goodness and reminding them of saying the shahada and so on. But it could also be a su al khatima, an evil ending, where they, 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 they outwardly it may look basic, but inwardly they're having a very difficult time. You might just see them passing away in a hospital but they're unable to do any form of dhikr. They're unable to have a good, beautiful ending. And that's, that's, that's the moment that the believer's life is preparing for. So what happens now? There's, there's no, this is not an intellectual game at this point. There's no intellectual uh, uh, component to this. I think we can totally turn that one off. I think it's fine. I think we can turn that one off, yeah. Is it helpful for you guys? It's fine? Yeah, we can turn it off. It's like a weird echo. Thank you. Um, so uh, what happens now is somebody will die according to the way they lived. There's no cheat codes. There's nothing one can just memorize and say, okay, now I'm going to find a way around this. The way in which one lived is the way in which they will die. If they lived a life of goodness and of righteousness, then we hope, and if Allah accepted it, we hope that it leads to a, a time, a death of goodness and righteousness. And if they live the opposite of that, Allah can always change it, but it's, 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 it's much more likely that it's a su al khatima, that it is a bad ending. So the reflection here, one should always think, okay, how are my days passing? How are my days passing? And am I living a life such that if I were to die tonight, or if I were to die tomorrow, or if I were to die in my sleep, I would be content with the day that I had lived before this. I would be, because there will not be some a specific moment at which it's going to be announced to us that now prepare yourselves and get ready. No, it's going to be that it comes. And it's mentioned many a time, and Imam Ghazali mentions this in his, in his text on death, that there were people who lived lavish lives and lives of luxury and the kings of this world and so on and so forth. And at some point, he mentions in, in a situation in which they have these like very, very gated homes, like a, kind of like a gated mansion type of situation. And so all of a sudden, somebody blows open the gates, blows open the gates. And the guards who are there say, who are you? Stop, get out of here. And he says, and he's just, and literally the guards have no impact on, on the one who's coming through the gate. So they can't, the guards are unable to stop them at the gate. Then there are more guards at the door that are unable to stop this one from, 
from coming. They're unable to stop this one from coming. So they go, they go to the house and he enters into the house and he, and he just completely walks past the guards. And then he enters into the home and he points to the, to the corrupt king, to the corrupt ruler. And he says, you, I've come for you. And I am, and, and now he knows the one, the king knows that this is the angel of death. The angel of death has come and there's no, and he says, give me some time. Just, I got some situations to take care of. I have some people to fix some things with. I have to take care of this. I, I want to live righteously. And he says, no, no time. You had your time. You had your whole life. You were given this. And he lists off all the blessings that he was given. And he lists off more and more things. And he says, and you didn't use it wisely. Now it's, it's just doom, doom for you. That's it. And now I've come to see it. And he, then he seizes his soul and the entire family around him is, is witnessing this. It's a, a, a unveiling has happened and they're able to see what most people are not able to see or witnessing this. And his soul is taken. And yeah, all of the life of, of luxury and, 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 and corruption and everything that people live, they enjoy the Hayat dunya It's fine. He, just, he goes back there. It, the, if the, if uh, they, they enjoy the Hayat dunya but Dada? it's not looking too good Daddy? after that. Um, and so they, they, this is the feeling that, that somebody can have. And so one should, one should practice Dada. this Dada. moment. One should practice Dada. this moment, right? And um, uh, really reflect, okay, how am I going to be in these, in these days if this happens to me? For the believer, it could be a, it's a very, very different experience. It's a very different experience. And for the Prophet, وسلم, permission was sought. If the angel of death doesn't, is, is not as high ranked as the Prophet, وسلم, permission was sought. Is it okay for me to take? Is it okay if I do this now? Because he's the greatest of Allah's creation. For the rest of us, permission is not going to be sought. The angel will come and will do what, they are, what he is supposed to do. But we hope that he will greet us. And he goes, and Imam Ghazali also mentioned the angel of death, checks on people multiple times a day or multiple times a week. And this might seem, how can one do this with billions of people? The angels don't operate inside of the realm of calculation. Just like we believe in unseen AI LLM models that can calculate they have insanely powerful computational capabilities. The angels that Allah has created have far more significant computational capabilities and abilities that Allah has given them. So they're checking on people. And so he's observing how, what kind of life are you living? But ultimately Allah will give the command, take this person's soul in this location at this time and the angel of death will be present. Not a minute before, not a minute after, is it possible for the soul to leave the body than what Allah has written for somebody. So this is a moment to prepare for. So, so the, the second takeaway is to imagine what happens when the angel, when the angel does this. And then you start to imagine now what happens when uh, the person goes from this moment of being, of passing away to what happens now, their body is washed, their body is washed. And so the believer feels the effects of the whistle. The believer feels it, it's all happening. It may seem like the mayyit, the one who has passed away is not feeling anything. They're feeling ev every, their sensory, their, their senses are amplified, in fact, according to some narration. So they feel a lot of things. They understand what's going on. They, they know if someone's treating them roughly or not. And so we, we, that they just transition into a different realm, into a different realm. Just like in this realm, the angels, they can see us, but we can't see them. In that realm, the dead, they know what's going on with the living, but the living, don't know what's going on with the dead, with the exception of the prophets that Allah opens the door of this to them and the prophets are able to see some of them, what's going on and the inheritors of the prophets, what's going on with the dead. And, 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 and um, so one now starts to, to, to be washed and one must prepare themselves for these moments. And then the funeral. So he goes into, into a little bit of detail in, in terms of what is the process by which the believer should have their funeral done and how should one prepare for this moment in their life? How should one prepare for this moment in their life where um, ideally they have a good ending and a righteous funeral, meaning righteous people attend, many people pray over them, and inshallah it's a means of forgiveness for them. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave many incentives for believers to attend the funerals, to attend the funerals. So he said that uh, much... Uh, anyone who escorts the janazah of a Muslim until he prays for him or her shall receive one measure of reward 
and, and each measure is the size of Mount Uhud. Mount Uhud is huge. If anyone has ever been to Medina Manawara, it's this huge, mighty, majestic, rock-like mountain. It's not like a dirt mountain. It's rock-like. It's huge. And so it's, that's one measure of reward that they receive for attending the janazah. And if they remain until they're buried, they receive two measures of reward, he says, in this narration. Um, and it is also said in one narration that whoever escorts the funeral of their fellow Muslim, Allah orders the angels to escort their funeral prayer and pray over them when they die. So one way one can prepare for death in these moments is make it a, a uh, habit. Okay, you know what? Once a month or once every three months, I'm going to escort, I'm going to make the time to go to a janazah. And I'm going to just, it's, if it's, especially if I can on a weekend or something, if people are busy with work during, and you don't need to actually know the people. There's people who are passing away in Masajid all the time. 31st Masjid right here down the street, 10 blocks away. They have a ghusl area. They pray janazah like every two, three days is a janazah after the heart that's being prayed. And so then the people just eat, whether they know them or not, they escort them to the, to the graveyard. And what does it do? Number one, it gives us the virtues of these deeds. But number two, it gives us the, uh, number two, it gives somebody the reflection of death because they'll say, you know, this is going to happen to me. And it's important when one looks at the body and the mayyids who's passed away, they're wrapped in, we, 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 we are wrapped in white shroud when we die, that one realizes themselves in that place. Not, we don't, we don't um, kind of divorce the reality and just, Oh yeah, I'm here. I just got to go through the motions. When we're present in front of the dead and going in, the, a sign of our heart being alive is that we understand the reality of what's happening. This person is about to go and be buried in a cover and a grave, and then they're about to meet Allah. That's the reality of what's happening. Their soul was just taken from the angel of death. So that's not a time of jokes, of laughing, of catching up with our friends, and so on and so forth. Janazas, especially when someone is able to see the body, should be a time of immense seriousness and weightiness. And ideally, where one is, where one is weeping, snacks. Sorry, my wife is out of town, and he is very attached right now. So, might if he runs around, I just ask them for a little bit of help and keep him entertained. Um, so one should have a weightiness to this. It's not a time of lightness, right? Hang, gang, getting food with people, hanging out at gathering. These are times of, of lightness. But funerals, janazas, they're times of heaviness. One should really, it should really hit us. What's happening? What's taking place here? And if we make it a habit to attend them, again, it doesn't have to be every day or every week. Although if somebody wanted to, they could attend janazas all the time because there's so many people. But one should make it a habit, especially the men. It is a far the kifaya of the community, a communal obligation that the janazah takes place. Communal obligation, as, as we've learned, is if somebody, if a few people in the community do it, everybody is lifted of the obligation. But if nobody in the community does it, then everybody carries the weight of the sin. It's different than the individual obligations like the prayers. Um, so one should try to make the intention to fulfill that obligation every now and then for the, for the sake of those who are, pa are passing away. And then he says that the uh, spirits, when they pass away, they endure. So the physical bodies, they may not endure. Some physical bodies decay, others do not decay, as Allah says in the Quran, that do not think that those who have been slain in the way of Allah are dead. Nay, they are alive with their Lord being provided for. And in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said their spirits will be inside green birds who freely move in the garden and retire into lanterns attached to the throne. So the, whatever the spiritual realities of what the Prophet ﷺ just said in the hadith, that we, it's, 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 the, the, the realities are very difficult for us to understand. But the fact that the, those who have passed in the cause of Allah or those who are very close to Allah among the Siddiqeen or especially among the Nabi'een, they don't pass the way a normal person passes and they don't live a life in the grave than the way a normal person in a life lives a grave. They live a very, very different type of life and a different type of experience. And this is what we hope and pray, inshallah, inshallah, is happening to our, our the martyrs in Philistine that may Allah accept their shahada and their martyrdom, that, they're, that they have not, they're not living a life anymore the way of 
they were living in, in this world of difficulty and of civil strife and of turmoil. But rather now they've been freed and they're with their Lord in, and he is providing for them in the most special of ways. Okay, this is Quran. This is Quran. This, even if one does not look at the narration of the hadith, this is in the Quran. And so it has also been related in another narration that the souls of the believers, I, I assume this means some believers, will be inside white birds which feed on the fruits of the garden. So um, uh, there's various ways in which the souls can roam in the realms, in the unseen realms, beyond just the physical ways. Right now we are in our physical realm. Our soul is in, is, is in our physical body, but it is, it's not going to be the case when somebody passes away. So he says, the dead person receives, perceives, and is aware of those who wash, shroud, and bury them. And it has been said that his spirit is held by an angel who stands near him and walks with it in his funeral so that he hears everything that's said about him. Everything that one says about the one who has passed away, the, the dead can hear, according to this narration. Now, that means that one should <laughs> ideally say good things about those who have passed away. If we have bad things to say, <clears throat> we avoid saying bad things in general, but especially at the time when someone has passed away, we only remember the good traits about that person, about that believer. Um, if they're a believer, if they're amongst one of these, uh, you know, oppressors or something like that, then they're doomed anyways. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same requirements um, that one would only say, uh, you know, what's, what's positive. Um, so then he says, now what happens? He says, when he's laid in the grave, he goes into the grave and he will be, there will be one time in your life, that's it. One time you die, that you'll be laid in the grave. And this is the moment, again, that we've been hopefully preparing for. All the ibadah and the ahmal and the attempts to draw near to Allah or our intentions to try to draw near to Allah really start to come to fruition in this moment when one passes away and they're laid in their grave. And so once he says one does it by saying Bismillah ala millati Rasulillah in the name of Allah according to the way, according to the religion of the Prophet and one lays the dead into the grave. And then those who are present throw dirt into the grave um, from the verses in the Quran, Woman that from it did we create you, uh, to it shall we uh, uh, shall we return you, you shall return to it, and from it we shall bring you forth another time. These are the three that one says when they are pouring dirt into the grave. This is um, uh, something one should always do for those who have passed away. And then, of course, they fill the rest of the grave. Now, for, the, for those of us who have not passed into the intermediary realm, obviously, we're here, one reflects on these moments. When you're at a grave, at a funeral, the whole point of the funeral is to think about what am I going to do when I'm there? In addition to praying for the deceased and letting it impact you, what am I going to do? When I'm in that state, what is going to happen to me? Will I be ready? Will I be at least somewhat ready? Or will I just be in a very difficult situation? And one should be at ease with dying. This is among the hallmark traits of the righteous is they're completely at ease with dying. No fear of death. Alhamdulillah, it's the day that I meet my Lord, is what they say. They're, 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 they're going to join with their, and with their beloved. The, the Sayyidina Bilal, an, the famous Sahaba, Sahabi, he was, that on the day that he was, uh, as, as it was very clear that he was going to pass in that day or the next, he was happy and he said something along the lines of, that on this day I'm going to meet Muhammad and his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to meet them, those who have passed before him, like Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq, Sayyidina Omar and then whoever. And, and now, and now I'm, I'm finally going to go meet them. He was so excited. He was so excited. And of course, his family was, was, was not as excited, and, and they were not in that, in that same state necessarily that he was in. But he, was, he knew that I will finally get to meet the Prophet Sallallahu now. And so their yearning was strong. The one whose heart is pure, the way to know, one of the other ways to know if the heart is pure is how much yearning do you have for Rasulullah and how much yearning do you have for Allah. One should have a, a, enough of a relationship and should focus on developing a relationship with the Prophet Islam, that one yearns to be with him and yearns to meet him and yearns to stand before him and kiss his blessed hands and yearns to give salam 
and yearns for the prophetic embrace and yearns for these things. One should yearn for this. People would, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and others would, would cry all night long, all night long, doing what? What was their, and what was their crying for? Just for the Prophet. Just for the, this yearning, missing him so much, missing him, missing him. This is one of the best types of, of, of ways to increase your connection to Allah is to increase your connection to the Prophet because he is Habib Allah and he is the door by which we go through Allah. We would not know Allah had it not been for the Prophet and had the Prophet not told us about him. So when this love of the Prophet will serve one well when they pass away and it will increase your yearning for the days in which you will meet. Then now what happens? He says one should recite some Quran while uh, possible at the grave and make dua for the deceased. So make dua for forgiveness and for, for that this person has an easy time in the grave and an easy time in transitioning. And then, and uh, different narrations mention different things. It's good to recite Surah Yasin for the one who's passed away. It's good to recite Surah Mulk. Uh, it's good to recite Ikhlas, had 11 times or any number of times. As much Quran as one can do, uh, one, should, one should recite. And one should have no doubt about the fact that if one is doing it with a sincere intention, that inshallah it will reach them and be a benefit. Um, then now the person who has passed away, the question is asked to them. Who is your Lord? What is your deen? And who is your prophet? And now this question, the answer does not come from your mind. Again, the same thing. And the, so the, the answer does not come from one's uh, mind at this point. So you won't be able to say, okay, well, I believe this, so Allah is my Lord. No, whoever one worshipped in this life, was it if it was money, if it was status, if it was fame, if it was prestige, if it was other people, that's what their response will be. If it was some celebrity, whoever you gave, we gave precedence to over Allah, meaning the time came when Allah's hukam was for something. And we didn't do that hook. I mean, we said we did something else. We said, you know what? It's more important that I do this thing, which was for some other intention. If one does that continuously and has not repented, then one should be, we should be fearful that that is what we are going to say, is our Lord. And then what is your deen? Islam is the answer. We know this, the way of submission. It's not, these questions are intellectually basic questions, but... What is the reality of our state? The reality of our state, whatever way we follow, whosever methodology we follow, that's what we're going to say. Whatever methodology we, so if we gave precedence to the religion of Islam, then inshallah, inshallah, we ask Allah give all of us tawfiq in this and divine assistance that we will say Islam. And then finally, who is your prophet? Again, the, whoever one looked up to the most, we all say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. How many of us really look up to the Prophet. So how many of us really um, that follow his sunnah in every way as much as we can in the best of our ability and yearn for it and don't minimize it. One of the most dangerous things that one can do that will that could ruin these moments is they minimize the sunnah. They make it say, why are you still doing stuff like that? Such a weird way of doing things. Right? Like that's a very, very or they laugh at the sunnah. No, 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 no. One should never laugh at any sunnah action or minimize any sunnah action. Even if we don't do that action, someone else is doing the action. Alhamdulillah, that they're doing the sunnah. One should not minimize it. Um, so the heart speaks now. The, the, the realities speak. Again, this world is flipped. The barzakh. The intermediary realm. It's not a world of... of what outward senses, it's a world of the inward realm. So whatever the reality of your situation is, that's what's going to come out of, of our situation. And we're going to say what we need to say. And this is what matters now. It doesn't matter what people think of you in this world. It doesn't matter how successful one was outwardly or not in this world. It doesn't matter how much money somebody made. It doesn't matter how much is in someone's bank account or their investment account or their 401k or their stocks or this thing or that thing. It doesn't matter how much prestige somebody gained or what level of, uh, of, of attention people give them. None of it matters. The only thing that matters really at the end of the day, 
did we get these questions right? And everything we do in life will play into whether we got these questions right. But this is the test that we should be preparing for more than any other test or any other exam. You know, like when we're young, we do, um, we prepare for exams in school if we, or if we're in college or, or graduate school, whatever, we prepare for exams, right? Ron prepares for their exams. And then when they, as they get older, sometimes they might be interviewing for a job or have to learn a new skill. They might have to prepare for an interview and they might have to prepare for a, a coding test or something else like that. There's preparation at different stages of life that's going on. The ultimate preparation is this, this is the ultimate test, whether somebody passes it or not. That's the big question that we want to be asking for ourselves. Um, and the, the main thing that's happened in our time is the seriousness of this has, has kind of disappeared. The seriousness of these moments, of these days, of, of the reality of what's going to happen in this time, it, it's not as present as it needs to be. And so the believers, how frequently do we mention death in our gap. It's, you don't go to a social gathering where someone is talking about death. The gatherings of the prophets and the Sahaba, they would talk about death. They would talk about it. It was like a very clear part. What would it be? Okay, how are you going to, are you going to be able to answer for that, what you just did or what you just didn't do, or what you just ate or what you just said when you died? This is the way the believers, they're constantly reminding each other. Remind for reminding benefits the believers. So in our life right now, let's not live a life of regret where we regret the time that we spent just letting time pass and never thinking about the serious, the weighty things. It doesn't mean one has to be doom and gloom all the time, but there's a seriousness to life that, the, that, that really, really, really one has to wake up to and, contem and, and contemplating and reflecting on these things is what will bring about the seriousness. So then he says that the one who... Allah allows to swerve in these questions, will be confused and hesitating. And just like in this world, they had been doubtful, hesitating, confused, torturous, neglectful of Allah's commands and prone to violate his prohibitions. Meaning they didn't do what Allah said to do and they didn't stay away from what Allah told them to stay away from. He said, they will say, I don't know, I don't know. They will start to get into a state of panic. At this point, nobody can help them. Khalas, it's done. Nobody can help them. He says, now at this point, in some narrations, the, 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 the striking will begin, meaning their torture in the grave will start and the grave will tighten around them and be filled with church torture. For some, eternally until the day of judgment and for others, according to how much Allah wants to punish them. We're talking, this could be thousands of years for some people, thousands, tens of thousands of years before they're resurrected and it gets even worse. All for what? For 60, 70 years of a life that we could have lived, we could have lived with righteousness. So this is what one has to reflect on and really seriously think, I'm going to be in a place six feet down under all by myself. If one can visit a graveyard by themselves or with somebody else and look into an open grave and just look, okay, how deep is it? Okay, how narrow is it? And that's it. Who's in there with us? Nothing only our deeds. Nobody is allowed to carry anything in with them. And that's it. Only the amal and, and their Lord will be present with them. And for the for the one who, who's in this state that he just mentioned, the grave constricts further until in some narrations, the ribs go like this and they keep going like this and this and this and, and, the, and the intensity of the punishment continues. And for others who are in the felicitous state, he says the firm believer, the mu'min, who, will be, who was established in faith during their life, will be given glad tidings by the angels. Their grave will become spacious, filled with light and delight, and their good works will surround them. So this is where your fasting, the prayers, charity, recitation of the Quran, remembrance of Allah, good character, treating other people kindly, treating our parents well, all the different traits that one is supposed to be doing in, in terms of the rights of Allah and the rights of the people, they will come to protect. So now the punishment's about to come. Quran comes and it says, no, you can't touch him. You can't touch her. Not, not, why? Because she recited Quran. She recited me, would stay up late to recite me, would fight their sleep in Ramadan to recite me. And now I'm going to protect them. His fast will come and the fast will say, you cannot touch this person. Why? Because they fasted for Allah's sake 
and now I am their fast, and they, they, they these are personified. This, they, they're, they're present, and they protect one. And all of the other ibadah comes and starts to protect one. So it's a very obvious situation. What should we do? How should we prepare? But the nafs doesn't want us to prepare in this life. So the, the more one can defeat their nafs, and this is why everything we've been talking about with regards to dhikr and, remember, and purifying the heart and remembering the moments in our life, remembering, uh, remembering Allah, and remembering the meeting with Allah becomes so important because one will feel a type of dread in this life where they're like, if I don't prepare for this, something's going to happen. And they'll wake up from their sleep. And others, if they stay asleep, they will never feel that dread, like that worry and anxiety of, I better prepare. I mean, and, and once that anxiety starts to kick in, it should be a, a, a activating force to make somebody um, prepare. As one hadith, the Prophet said, I've never seen anything more terrifying than the grave. The Prophet has seen a lot, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, I've never seen something more terrifying than the grave. And one time Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, he came near a grave and he wept so much that his entire beard became wet. And um, uh, it's because he said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu say, the grave is the first of the hereafter stages of the stages of the Akhirah. If one is saved from it, then what comes next is easier. But if one is not saved from it, then what comes next is even harder. It's already hard enough with what we just read. And this is not, he barely described it. If we have time, maybe next time, or if we can get through the rest of the, the, the sessions, we'll get into what Imam Ghazali says it detail about the grave, every step of what's going to happen, the types of punishments that are possible. He gets, there's a lot of detail that's written in our tradition about the grave. We're, we're very fortunate to know what goes on in the Akhirah. Many people do not have not been given this access to this unseen realm and knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ gave us access to. So then it is said, why does the torment of the grave happen? It is because of three things mainly. All sins can bring punishment, but the Prophet ﷺ is summarizing. He says, because first, people used to, we used to talk bad about other people. That's the first, is slander and backbiting. The second is calumny. What's calumny? Calumny, it's tail-bearing, meaning, did you hear what happened to this person? Did you hear what she said? Did you hear what they said? Did you hear, oh, that person, they, talk, they said this thing bad about you. Are you still going to hang out with them? Why would you hang out? It's spreading the bad that other people say about you to other people. Just, just the worst types of gossip. This is one of the main sources. Imagine every sin the Prophet ﷺ could have listed. He says the main sources of punishment for the grave are these. Because why people take them lightly. Other sins, we might do a sin and it might really hit us. But we talk bad about people. And may Allah forgive us all the time. All the time. All sorts of, 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 of things that we say. So we have to take ourselves to account. The tongue, this is what's going to get us in trouble. The main thing that's going to get us in trouble is this tongue. Just... Sayyidina Abu Bakr used to like hold the tongue and sometimes be seen walking around filled, filled with his mouth filled with rocks. Imagine somebody who walked around now with his mouth full of rocks. What would we think of them? This is the greatest of Allah's creation after the prophets. Is Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq. And he said, the tongue is what gets me in trouble. This tongue is what gets me in trouble. Trying to prevent. The tongue is what gets me in trouble. Just trying to keep it quiet. Trying to keep the tongue quiet. Not, not overdoing it. So... One should be very careful. What am I saying? Am I saying an examine? Okay, I'm about to say some, someone just brought up somebody who I don't like. I know that there's like a 98% chance that I say something bad. So I better just leave the room or change the topic or pull out my phone and bring something else up and change it up before I let myself get into more trouble because this is about to get bad. Because and, and so that's the first two things. The third thing is one not caring them, care, uh, uh, one not taking care of themselves when after they use the restroom and the uh, najasa of the restroom gets on them. This is one of the main things. Is one one narration. One who does not guard themselves against being soiled um, with with najasa, with urine, with other things, they will have the carelessness by which they did that, and then they would go out and pray and do other things will have an impact on them in terms of the punishment in the grave. So the believer is pure and is clean and does their best to clean themselves. Does their best to clean themselves. This is why for, for this total side topic, but for men, it's not permitted for, to, to stand up and urinate. Sorry to get very specific, but this is one of the main things why, where this happened. This hadith is applied. 
one can one must make sure that they are properly urinating and such that they are kept clean and that they clean everything. For for all believers must keep themselves clean. Must keep them. We're not saying that, that, that is completely haram in all circumstances, but the scholars have essentially said that this hadith would 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 be uh, uh, one would be acting against it in that situation unless it, they were like you know desperate. Um, and so the Prophet والسلام, he would frequently make dua from the grave's torment. And he urged others to include in their supplications, in their du'as, uh, protection from the grave. So we always make du'a for the dunya. Ya Allah, I want this. Ya Allah, I want that. Ya Allah, I want... The vast majority of the du'as of the human being are for this life. The vast majority of the du'as of the righteous are for the next life. We have to figure out how are we going to slowly increase the number of du'as that we make for the next life. We don't just want to do like a super quick, and I'm saying this to myself first and foremost, Ya Allah, make it easier for me in the Akhirah. Okay, and can I have this car and this job and this and this? And we can ask him for all of it. There's nothing wrong with asking him for as many things as possible in his dunya. But at least one minute, two minutes of the du'a, once a day, should be for the Akhirah. Maybe if not once a day, once a week. Ya Allah, make my uh, death easy for me. Because then the reality will sink in. If, if it's not just a, a, a thing that's going to happen one day. So, and again, I'm saying this to myself first and foremost because I'm thinking about du'as that I make and they're far from making du'as to, for the Akhirah. So we should all try to make it a habit, um, at least on Fridays, a virtuous day, sit down after Salat al-Jummah or some other time of the day and just try to make a significant portion of our du'a for the Akhirah. And ask Allah over and over again. Allah is too generous for us to be asking 20, 30, 40, 50 years of our life and praying not to give. And the main du'as that we should make, we should start with on virtuous nights and on um, virtuous moments like hajj and other moments, is du'as for the akhirah. And then, of course, anything we want in this dunya, ample time to inshallah make those, those du'as as well. So that's a very quick summary of what happens, and then we'll just go up, we'll do one other section, and then we'll end, inshallah, um, for quick questions, and then pray, Isha. Um, so then he says, okay, what's going to happen? He said that one thing can benefit you once you pass away, and that's the du'as and some of the actions of the people who are still here. So if your children or your family members or your loved ones or your friends pray to Allah for forgiveness for you, Allah can forgive you and me while we are in the grave, even if we had done so much wrong. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said in one narration that were it not for the living, the dead would have been doomed. Why? Because according to the commentary, the prayers and the quest for forgiveness and for mercy that they receive. And alhamdulillah that the Muslims, there's some Muslims, they make dua all the time for all the Muslims. Allah maghfili mu'minina wal mu'minat, Allah hiyahum wal amwat. That, oh Allah, forgive the believing men and women, those who are alive and those who have passed away. So there are people in the ummah, alhamdulillah, they're always praying for the believers who have passed. And, but we should make it a habit, at least our grandparents, our parents, if they've passed, daily, if not weekly, we pray for them. Ya Allah, have forgive, forgive my parents, even if they're alive or if they've passed. Forgive those who have passed away in iman before me. They need the du'a as the most desperate thing that they, that they could ask for is the du'as, or the most, the most essential thing rather that they could ask for. The Prophet he says in one narration, um, for somebody to uh, give on behalf of someone who has passed away. So someone asked him, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu an asked him, my mother's soul departed suddenly and had she been able to speak, she would have given charity. Would it bring her benefit if I did so on her behalf? And he said, yes. So he dug a well, the Sa'ad, on behalf of his mother and said, this is for my mother. So this is what's called sadaqa jariya. One does a, you, you make a masjid in someone's behalf. You dig, dig a well, you give donation on their behalf. You give sadaqa on their behalf once they've passed away. We should do this and instill this in our siblings, parents, uh, or rather uh, children, people who may be alive after we pass away. May not, but they may be. And to sadaqa jariya is essential. Give on my behalf, please, please give charity regularly. Remember me visit my grave frequently. This should be a habit that we should do with our children and hopefully they will do with us when we have, um, when we have passed away. Uh, then another narration says that, Ya Rasulullah, my parents have died. Is there anything left by, me, by, by, by which um, 
with which I may be doing good to them. I can do good to them. He said, yes, there are four things. Praying, asking forgiveness for them, carrying out their promises, and being good to their friends and their family. Those are ways that you can benefit them. So praying for sure on their behalf and asking forgiveness, but also doing the virtue that they taught you in this life. Anytime somebody does a virtue, whoever taught them the virtue gets the reward for it. It's amazing. This is why if we can teach children the Quran and the prayer, ooh, that's, and hopefully that person has a long life in obedience, that is a huge key. Some of the scholars towards their later stages of life, that's all they would want to do. They would just teach children the Fatiha. Why? Fatiha, how many times a day does someone say it? 17, at minimum if they pray five times a day, let alone if they pray Sunnah and Nawafil. And then they're always saying it, always doing it, and then the Quran. And so if someone teaches one how to recite the Quran and teaches one how to pray, Alhamdulillah. Don't let anyone ever take that deed away from you. Do not let the Sunday school teach your kids how to pray. Make sure we are the ones to do that. Not let the Sunday school teach our kids how to recite. But at minimum, that's the stuff that we want to get the reward for. Hopefully, the Sunday school can add some stuff and, te- and they can get some reward too. But for, for, for anybody who we can teach Quran to, any, especially amongst those who are young, we should do. And, and other good deeds as well. So he says that, that um, recite Quran and send it as a reward for them. There's ikhtilaf in the ummah about whether this reaches the dead or not. According to some narrations, even though there's weakness in them, it does. And what the scholar said is when it comes to difference of opinion on Allah's mercy, whether Allah is going to be merciful enough for it to benefit them or not, side on the side of Allah's mercy. So if anyone says, oh, why are you reciting Yasin for this person? It's not going to benefit them anyways. You could just say, okay, how about instead I scroll on Instagram and waste my time like everybody else? Like, what do you want me to do? No, recite Yasin for the dead. Like, the, in the time we live in, any good, even if the hadith is extremely weak, but it's been narrated that it's good to do. And it's from the a'mal, not from aqidah or fiqh, meaning it doesn't impact your core belief or your fiqh. It's like an extra good deed we should 100% do. In the time we live in, too many people discourage others from doing good. Even the night tonight, 27th of Rajab, Isra al Miraj. Is it, is, do, do some people have a difference of opinion on this night? Maybe like five people. Yes, they do. Is it worth listening to those people? Sure, yeah, let's just watch a soccer game tonight instead of worshiping Allah. That's like, this is the type of logic that people use. Say, no, 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 don't worship Allah. Instead, just live, just just keep, just be, play really, really careful. Instead, just live a dunya life. And don't do anything extra. No, instead, one, what does the scholar say? If there's a chance that the virtue will increase one, one goes for the virtue, whether it's a little bit or a lot. Because we err on the side of Allah's mercy always, especially in the time that we live in. So he says, recite Quran and often try to send it for them. If we can do this for our parents, grandparents, others, ikhlas, he says, 11 times a day or 11 times frequently, he said, this is one good thing to do. Send them the, the reward of the of Surah Al-Ikhlas, um, and, and other, uh, other, uh, other forms of Qur'an. If one can do a portion of the Qur'an and regularly say, you know what, I'm going to do this portion weekly and I'm going to send it to all of those as a gift. What is the intention one makes is, Ya Allah, send this as a gift and as a reward to my grandma or to my grandfather or to all of them. And then, inshallah, according to one narration, it's presented to them as a light, as like a nur, as a gift coming from this person living in this location or this person, the son of this person, and then, or the daughter of this person, and then it's presented to them. These are very, very noble and virtuous things that one can do. Um, and we should teach our children to do this so that they can do it for us and nobody, people don't forget about us. The last thing we want to do is be forgotten about in this manner. So that's the essence of what we want to cover for right now. We want to do a little bit more, but for the sake of time, we'll just briefly talk about the virtues of, of Isra and Miraj, and then we'll end. Inshallah. So tonight is the 27th of Rajab. 27th of Rajab is Laylat al Isra wal Miraj, according to most narrations. This is the night in which the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when it was a very, 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 very virtuous night. Most of them say, the scholars, that this was the best night of his life. Alayhi salatu wasalam, the best night of his life. Why? What happened on this night? There are many takeaways. A few first takeaway. The year before this night, before this, this event happened, was a very difficult year for the Prophet. 
his uncle, Abu Talib, passed away. His uncle was protecting him and was like a father to him. This is the father of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh, Ali ibn Abu Talib. This is, so this is the uncle of the Prophet sallam, very close to him. So his uncle passes away. Already he's lost. His, he'd already lost his father before he was born. Then he lost his blessed mother. Then he loses his grandfather, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. And then he, now he loses his uncle. And others in his family had also passed. And then also who passes away in the same year? His wife. Is the first and the the the, the great Sayyidah Khadija Tal Kubra radiallahu anha that she passed away and she supported him when no one supported him. She was there for him when revelation was first given to him. She embraced him. She 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 provided for him. She helped him. She supported him. She encouraged him. She passes away in this year as well. And so now he's left. All the people who had supported him, they're gone. The people who had loved him, they're gone. But Allah remains with him. Allah who loves him the most and also gives him all of his support, he remains. And then what else happens in this year before this event? The, the, the moment, the event of Ta'if happens where the Prophet ﷺ goes to Ta'if to do, to do what? To do da'wah, to invite them to Islam so that all these very difficult situations don't happen when one passes away. And they reject him vehemently, really intensely reject him. They throw stones at him. They push him out of the city until his blessed feet were bleeding. In some narrations for a kilometer or two, a mile roughly, uh, where they just kept chasing him out. All for what? For calling Allah, calling them to Allah. Very difficult situation. And so he faced, and there was a lot of squeezing that happened in this year. It was known as the year of prison, of difficulty and, and distress and, and anxiety, or not anxiety, grief. And then it was in this time, Allah chooses to bless him with Isra and Miraj. So the first lesson in this is Allah will squeeze us a lot before the biggest opening. A lot before the biggest opening. And, and it's not easy squeezing for everybody. But the opening does come, and when it comes, it's great. It's, it's, it's a great opening. And we, hope, we ask Allah give a huge fat to the people of Palestine, a huge opening, because the, what they're being going through is just, it's un, un, we can't even comprehend it in terms of the level of difficulty that they're going through. But inshallah, with it is a huge opening that's coming, and we should not doubt that for a second. Uh, what happens? He goes from Masjid al-Haram. Jibreel al-Islam shows up with the burak and tells him to ride. To ride this Burak, which is like this flying, majestic white horse. And he goes from Masjid al Haram al Masjid al Aqsa to where? To Jerusalem, to the farthest mosque. And he leads all of the prophets in prayer in this masjid. Masjid al Aqsa, may Allah free it from these occupiers, that it is, the, it is very significant for the Muslims and it plays a very significant role on this night. And it should be a night in which we pray abundantly for Palestine. And then he goes from there to Jannah to heaven. So the first thing, and he ascends to heaven and he has various events. We don't have time to get into all the details, but I would advise um, if, 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 if folks can to read in the seerah about the events that took place. Amazing things happened on this night. He went to every level of heaven and met different prophets. And it was a way of teaching the Prophet ﷺ and also teaching us as an ummah of what's going to take place. The second thing that happens that's huge on this night is he goes and he directly, he goes to a point, Sayyidina Jibreel is his tour guide and showing him around heaven. Okay. And he goes to a point where Jibreel says, I can't go past this point. If I go, I'll just burn. There's too much light. I can't go. This is only for you. This station is yours. The Prophet والسلام, the greatest of Allah's creation. And he goes and now he enters in to the divine presence to meet Allah directly. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you read that in the prayer, this is what you're reading. This is what we are reading. This is what uh, the greeting of Allah to the Prophet. As what does he do in this time? He is with Allah. All he, he's with his Lord. He could just, just be with his Lord. Assalamu alayna ala ibadillah salihin. And peace be upon us and the righteous. Of Allah's servants. He remembers the Ummah in his most difficult times. He remembers this Ummah. He always cares for the Ummah. The Prophet's concern for the Ummah 
we can't even begin to understand his concern. His concern is so vast for this ummah. And he remembers this ummah in the divine presence. And what does Allah give him? Anytime you go to the house of a very, very generous host, you will leave with a gift. What about the Lord of the heavens and the earth who calls you into his direct presence? And the gift of the salah is given now, the formal ritual prayer. It's given as 50 until he goes down. He goes down now to the next heaven, to the seventh heaven. And, and, and um, uh, or I don't know if it was on the seventh or the fourth where Musa al Islam met him. Musa al Islam tells him there's no way they're going to do 50. They can't do 50. 50 prayers too much. You'll be praying all the time. Every 10 minutes would be a prayer. Not, he says, okay, he goes back up. And this happens multiple times. It's reduced by 5, 45, 40, 35. Until finally, after so many times of going and meeting Allah, until finally it's five prayers. And then he says, Musa al says, they still won't be able to do five. And he just says, the Prophet says, I, I'm too shy to go. I'm not going to ask for anything else. This, Allah says, you do five, you get the reward of 50. Five with the reward of 50. This main lesson we take away is the salah, this gift that was given, is one of the only things that was given directly to the Prophet ﷺ with no intermediary. Angel Jibreel Islam did not give him the salah like he did the Quran. The salah was given directly to the Prophet for us. To do what? So it's our form of this night journey of ascension. If somebody prays their salah, it's the means of relief for him or her. And it's a means of their getting close to Allah and reliving this. And the salah has a, you literally relive this moment in the salah. It's amazing what took place. And third, the th third key thing to remember is there was a lot of du'as the Prophet ﷺ learned on this night and the Prophet ﷺ taught about this night in terms of protection and, and du'as that we should do to avoid um, uh, the, 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 the uh, things that he saw and he witnessed in terms of the punishments that take place in the unseen. But the key is that we use this time to make du'a for ourselves and for relief for the ummah and to rec renew our prayer. If we've been weak with our prayer, if we've been slackening in our prayer, renew the prayer. This is a night in which one should strive to pray Qiyam, strive to pray Tahajjud. Uh, it's very good to do so. There's no specific ibadah one needs to do or has to do or that's been narrated, except that it's a good night for dua. And it's a good night to contemplate how much love and concern the Prophet ﷺ has for us. And it's a very, very, very special night for Jerusalem and for Masjid al-Aqsa. It is when the Masjid al-Aqsa was honored with the presence of the greatest of Allah's creation. Before it, many prophets had prayed in it and had prayed in the Temple Mount in that general area. Now the Sayyid of all the Mursaleen came and he was the one who was told to lead. He was the one pushed towards the front because he is the greatest of Allah's prophets and this is the greatest of Allah's ummahs, of Allah's communities, inshallah. And we hope and we pray for Faraj and for relief for this ummah in all the places, especially in Gaza and in Palestine and the West Bank, and that Allah free the Masjid al Aqsa from these occupiers. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. If we have a few minutes for questions, we can do questions and then we'll pray Isha. Inshallah. Yes. Yeah, good question. So for the deceased, right, for who has passed, <clears throat> the question is du'as that we can make. Um, three or four du'as that we should regularly make. First, that Allah forgives them of all their sins. That Allah encompasses them in his mercy completely. Um, the next, that Allah makes their grave a garden from the garden of paradise. That he makes their grave enlightened and a garden from the gardens of Jannah. And that he makes their grave fast and makes their moments in the grave easy for them. The next is a dua that Allah makes it easy for them on the day of judgment and that he allows them to enter Jannah in without any hisab. So basically all the events that will now take place and we'll talk about them in the next few classes inshallah um, that will take place after one dies, one makes dua for those things. In terms of specific surahs, at minimum, he mentions the virtues of doing it three times, 11 times, we should do so. Um, what we've seen is our teachers do, they'll do the Fatiha and they'll send it to the to the deceased. That's very common. And then ikhlas. And then for those who we really can, yasin is very good to do. So some of them they do yasin daily one time for all of those in their family who have passed away. Um, if you can't do so daily, weekly, monthly, um, uh, but but there's no specific surah. So you could just recite Quran frequently and send it as well. Yeah. Yes. 
So you mentioned that. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned that the main, the two main religious people of the Hindu culture and the great are Sandal, Kalu, and the Yes. Yep. Uh, According to one narration, yeah. Yeah. So the um, East still happen even if we are fed from them and if we are not fed from them, we get the fed from them. Question is: mention it was mentioned the sins that um, <clears throat> that take place when, uh, or rather, the punishment that takes place due to certain sins when one is in the grave. Um, and so, does it happen if we repent? And uh, how do we pure, perfect our repentance? But <clears throat> anything we repent from is erased, inshallah. So, <clears throat> if we repented, we don't worry too much that in, inshallah as long as allah accepts our repentance and we fulfill the conditions of repentance which we spoke about in the last class which are sincerity and asking making the intention to never do that sin again um and then uh allah uh, Muhammad, making the intention to never do that sin again with a firm with a very 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 um firm resolve and feeling remorse guilt in their heart then you assume the repentance is accepted and in these situations that's what uh, uh the assumption should be and then one should strive to not do it again. With regards to talking bad about people, if one caused a lot of fitna, um, one should go and do good deeds in their name. Because the best is to go and say, I said such and such about you, I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me? But that's not going to go over well in the time we live in. Most of you aren't going to handle that well. So what you do is you um, you uh, give them, give, do some good deed in their name, that Ya Allah, I sought forgiveness for this and I'm trying to do good in their name, and then you speak good about them as much as possible to make up for the bad. But repentance, assume that it's erased. Yeah. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Good question. Question. Uh, women going to the graveyard, janazah, is there a basis for that? Um, uh, there's some basis for it if the practices that someone does are um, really problematic. But if they're not, then many of the scholars have permitted it. So you have differing opinions on this. Uh, much of it has become culture now. So in certain cultural uh, practices, um, it's become this huge thing which is overemphasized, like, no, 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 women can't go, women can't go, this is not okay. It's, it's part of the, a lot of people just like to kind of control women, um, but it's not to be taken out of context. So there's a few things to keep in mind in context. First is if a woman goes and she, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, some women would do something called wailing, which is this really intense cry where somebody doesn't accept what's happened and they're kind of are screaming like, why did this happen? Why, why, why? And that's not permitted in Islam. So once someone dies, we're not allowed to ask Allah, why did it happen? We say, Ya Allah, I'm really, really, it's really tough on me, but you're not questioning why did this happen to me? And especially not out loud. Like there's one thing if the whispers happen internally. So in a situation where that's going to likely be the case, one would, um, one would not one would not uh, uh, encourage that. And so this used to ha happen at the time. And so men would usually be the ones who are accompanying janazas. And then what would happen in the time is the women would usually go afterwards and they would visit the graves. It's totally per totally permitted for women to visit the graves. Anybody who doubts that um, doesn't know their deen. It's completely permitted, encouraged. Say the Fatima radiallahu anha would often go to visit her uncle or the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anha. It's mentioned that women would go to Baqi and visit Baqi um, and Janatul Baqi, which is the graveyard in Medina Manawara. And so that's, that's very much encouraged to do. The second reason they avoided it is because in societies where there's segregation, now there's mixing that goes on. Um, and so if we're, this is where you apply your own, you know, not your own, but you apply criteria, right? If we're not in a society where that is the case anymore and women are standing in one area, and men are standing in another area. And everyone is doing everything with modesty and with, with respect and with dignity. And one is carrying themselves properly, both the men and the women. Then, inshallah, there should not be a problem a problem with this. Um, and and so those are some of the reasons why there's not like a for sure yes or no. It's not that black and white. Uh, I would I would I've generally seen our teachers recommend that women do go to the graveyard. And it doesn't have to be for the janaza. Janaza at minimum, the men need to go to fulfill the obligation. 
but definitely to go to the grave, visit, make du'a, contemplate death, um, think about the fact that they will actually be there at some point is, is completely in line with the sunnah of the ummahat al-mu'mineen, of the mothers of the believers. Yeah. Hopefully that helps a bit. And then if, if more details needed, we can expand next time on kind of why some of these things may exist in our religion. Yeah, yeah there was a question. Could you be a little louder? Sorry. Yeah. Um, the last part was, can you send them? A yeah, 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 yeah. More than so, you can make an intention that I'm going to read Yasin for my grandma, my grandfather, my other grandmother, my other grandfather, my cousin, my aunt. I'm just thinking of some of the people I know who have passed away in my life, and then you just keep going. One Yasin for all of them, or Separately, I'm going to do Surah Ikhlas for each of them separately. So Surah Ikhlas takes like 10 seconds to read, 30 seconds, right? Yasin takes like 10 minutes. So it just, you can, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, inshallah. Yes. Oh, one more time. Oh, no, it, it doesn't matter. I was mentioning the example of Surah Ikhlas as uh, you would do that because it's just really short. Um, all, the benefit of ikhlas is that it's a khatam of Qur'an, 33% of the Qur'an, one-third of the Qur'an, reciting ikhlas once. So you send three of them to somebody, and it's the whole Qur'an, inshallah. So we should do so, because it's easy, we should try to do so frequently for those who have passed away. Um, but we can do a general intention and just recite surah ikhlas three times for all those who have passed away. And then when we have time, we do more, inshallah. But we should have kind of a bare minimum that we don't leave. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. One more question. Let's see, online. What book are you referring to? Imam Ghazali's book, uh, Kitab, the book on the remembrance of, uh, of, of death and the Akhira. Um, it's the book 40 of the Ahya al It's been translated by uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Timothy Winter. Um, and you can get it online. It's a very, very good book. How do we teach our hearts to speak the right answer when we are in the Qabr? Purely based on the life that you live. If you live a life of righteousness and you pray your five prayers, you will, inshallah, be in a good in a good state. Um, and pray your five prayers. All the ver things we're supposed to do with regards to the fara'id in our religion and the virtuous deeds uh, will be in a good state, inshallah. And if, if we disobey Allah's commands and what he has told us to stay away from, then that's where we're going to struggle. So our deen already is preparing us. But the extra work that has to be done is extra adhkar and extra remember, remembrances to purify the heart. To purify the heart. Yeah, one should, um, is visiting the grave after Maghrib not recommended? The Prophet ﷺ would go uh, at nighttime to the graves. So that's what we have learned from the Sunnah. Um, would, not, would, 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 would not advise um, one go alone uh, necessarily in the time we live in, bec not because it's not the sunnah, but just because of the things that could be happening um, there in terms of the unseen realm. But but the Prophet ﷺ would go sometimes every night and to the grave and reflect. Yes? When we visit the grave, where do we stand? Um, so we'll talk about this, inshallah, next time, where he talks about the, 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 the etiquettes of visiting the grave. But ideally, you stand um, in front of the grave, like right at the foot, and then you give your salam. And the person can hear your salam. You assume they can hear your salam. And that's where you would make the dua, and you would make, you know, recite Quran. Um, so you should stand facing them. You can also stand at their head or sit down close to their head. Um, but most of the what we've learned is that people are kind of sitting down or standing where their feet are, and that and and that's where they're um, present. But it really depends on if there's room there or not. If it's like a small constricted space. You go where you'll be comfortable because there they can hear you when you give your salam. And then if you, it's com more comfortable to sit somewhere else because there's more more room, you can do that as well. Yeah. But next time, inshallah, he's going to hopefully we'll have time to get into the etiquettes. Uh, the live is glitchy today. Oh, sorry about that. It's. Um, the internet has some issues. Okay, we'll end with the dua and then um, 
pray Salat al Isha. Uh, so moving forward, the class will start at seven, inshallah. Isha will be after the class because the Masjid Isha time has changed now, inshallah. So just a note. Um, Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbana atina fi dhani hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa kina adhaab al-naar. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka anta samiyu al-alim wa tubalayna inna ka anta tawab al-Rahim. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Fatah, Ya Mubin, Ya Arham al-Rahimin. We ask, Ya Allah, that you on this blessed night, on this noble night of relief, Ya Allah, that you give faraj to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you give faraj and relief to the people of Gaza and to the people of Palestine, and that you give faraj and relief to all of those who are suffering, and that you give water to those who are thirsty, and food to those who are hungry, and warmth to those who are cold, and ease to those who are in difficulty, Ya Rabbil Alameen, amongst the people of Palestine, Ya Allah, and all over the Muslim world, Ya Allah, we ask that you give comprehensive relief and ease to them and that you console the hearts of those who have lost their family members and their children and those who have lost others in this difficult situation in this genocide that's taking place we ask that you stop this situation ya allah we ask that you end this situation that you give relief to the muslims that you give victory to the muslims that you give victory to the muslims ya rabbil alamin we ask that you give victory to the muslims over the kuffar rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala alqawm alkafirin we ask that you give comprehensive ease and relief to this ummah ya allah we ask that you give openings to this ummah we ask that you free masjid al-aqsa we ask that you free masjid al-aqsa we ask that you free this noble masjid in which your prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed and led the prophets in prayer ya rabbil alameen we ask ya allah that you look down upon this ummah and that you pardon us for the wrongs that we have done and for the wrongs that we are continuing to do and that you do not allow our wrongs to be means of suffering for this ummah we ask that you give victory to the muslims all over the muslim world that you stop the oppression the oppression of the zionists the oppression of the americans and of the british and of all these different people who are oppressing and who are bombing and who are delighting in their destroying of the muslims ya allah we ask that you take care of this kuffar and that you completely take care of them in the way that you know best ya rabbil alameen ya rabbil alameen ya rabbil alameen we ask you Ya Allah, you are our Lord and you are the one who we can turn to for help and we turn to nobody else for help but you. We ask that you give us afia in our life and that you give us well-being and that you give us firmness in our religion and that you give us an uprightness in our religion to give us the ability to stand firmly upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and to give us the ability to practice this religion properly and give protection to us and to our loved ones and to our family members and to our children and that you give forgiveness to all of those who have passed away before us who are in Islam and that you protect the deen of all of those who will come after us. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you give barakah in our lives and that you remove our sicknesses and our problems and our worries and our anxieties and that you allow us to prepare in the best way for the moment when we will pass away and that you allow us to die upon La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We ask that you give us an ease in the moment when we die and that you give all of us and our parents and our loved ones and our family members and our siblings and our loved ones who will come after us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. A husn al khatima, the best of endings, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we ask that you do this for all of those who are struggling in your way and who are fighting in your way and that you accept them all. As shuhada wa sallallahu wa sallam, barakala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.